Welcome to DNF. This is a Formula One podcast. I am Spencer Hall, joined as always by Jessica Smetana, live from the Miami studios. I am going to address one thing at the very top. It's a lot of news, a lot of things going on in the world of Formula One and in racing in general. But what I want to explore first, of course, is something talking about me. Um, and that is this. Why does Williams have me blocked? Oh, Spencer, I thought you'd never ask. Why? Um, so I under, as I understand it, you found out today that you're blocked from Williams because <gasps> I have the hiccups, by the way. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should start with that. I have an incurable case of the hiccups, and, okay. and there's truly like nothing we can do about it. This is the only time we can record this podcast. So hopefully... <gasps> Hopefully they just go away at some point. Um, you went on Twitter to see the Williams news. Yes. And discovered that you're blocked from Williams racing F1. That's right. On That's Twitter. right. So you had to share Correct. it with me in chat. The news being that the only American driver on the grid, Logan Sargent, has been dropped for the remainder of the 2024 F1 season. He will be replaced by Franco Colapinto, a 21-year-old Argentine racer is being promoted from his F2 seat to take over Sargent's spot, right? Um, this was official as of today. Um, that is the sixth place driver in F2 at the moment and uh, is obviously up to the challenge of racing as well as Logan Sargent did because Logan, Logan Sargent did not race very well. Didn't get a point this year. <laughs> Didn't get a point this year. Um had some extremely expensive crashes, mm -hmm. including one this past weekend at the Dutch Grand Prix in the final practice session. Uh, his car was up. His car went up in flames. It was a, a video that a lot of people were sharing because it looked pretty, pretty crazy as he was like climbing out of his car. Um, a very high speed crash and one that obviously cost the team a lot of money. And Josh Fowles, the head of the head of Williams has been pretty vocally like, yeah, this costs us a shit ton of money. We don't like yeah. this. This is not good. We've been getting stories all season of, oh my gosh, the Williams mechanics have been working so hard and they're so ingenious and their engineers have worked around so many problems just to get the car back on the road. And those are all very legitimate stories. They have done a great job ensuring that Williams would make it to the track. That's uh, supply chain difficulties and logistics be damned. They were going to make it happen. That's all true. The flip side to some of these stories is our driver can't stay out of the wall. Our driver can't stay out of uh, other drivers' way. Our driver can't make points. And we this is getting to be too pricey for a team that cannot afford a whole lot of cost overruns. Williams at this point is ninth in the constructors. They have four points. Four. Um, that is behind Alpine and eight, who have 13th. Uh, and just ahead of Sauber, who have none. They're very stinky. Sauber is like, oh, man, they stink. Um, and they're obviously like sort of in a weird limbo where next year there's going to be a lot of changes and they're mm -hmm. sort of like refashioning the team. So sort of understandable. But Williams, yeah, like the money that they spend rebuilding the car to ra <laughs> to race mm -hmm. is money that they can't spend on developing future improvements to the car so like there's a very it's it is a zero-sum game <laughs> like it money is spent on something that you don't want to spend it on comes mm -hmm. from somewhere else where it could probably be better used i feel pretty good about you having the hiccups while we're discussing Williams. i feel terrible no. i mean i feel like doug is now gonna have to decide if he's if he's gonna go back and just cut all of these out and spend like 17 hours editing this or mm -hmm. leave them in and the people that listen to it are gonna be like holy shit that's annoying um, they will be, they will think that it's annoying, but also, you know, Hey, what's more relatable than having the hiccups while discussing how the only America driver on the grid never really got it started. I think it's he very did, he hard. Did get, he did get one point in, in sure. 2023, right? At the USGP. That yes. was his, his first and only point in F1, I believe. I, I believe that is his only point. We will verify live by looking things up on the internet. That's what a podcast is, by the way checking the internet live while recording it is it's we're going to ask you to believe a lot of things here at once a lot of things uh, that includes one that logan Sargent definitely got this chance a bit too early in his career 
he wasn't ready and he didn't it, it is true that he both was not ready and did not have an ideal situation in the form of Williams who while employing another really good driver um uh, in Alex Albon has only gotten one point in the last two years only two years and and he only got that point by the way thanks to a disqualification of uh the Leclerc old fiasco yeah yeah that's and a Hamilton. good point um so back to your initial question which is why are you blocked by Williams racing on Twitter I do have some theories mm -hmm. I searched your handle against the name Williams yeah, a uh, lot of Caleb Williams tweets, a lot of Quentin Williams, Jameson Williams tweets. So I, I sifted through some of those and I didn't really see much Williams racing fodder. Um, but then I did search EDSBS Latifi and I think that did it. Spencer <laughs> uh, on August 28th, 2022, almost uh, exactly a year ago, mm -hmm. two years ago, you tweeted, bring me the head of Nicholas Latifi. Mm -hmm. Um you think that on, did it? That might have done on it. On 11 20, 22, you said Latifi had to give the people one last bit of razzle dazzle, and I appreciate that. Which, you know what? That is a tweet of appreciation. It is true. Um, probably though. for him getting a safety car late at like the uh, like Abu Dhabi or mm -hmm. something. Um, then you tweeted in May of that same year, Latifi has taken three pit stops just out for a cruise today, man. And then mm -hmm. you tweeted that Nicholas Latifi remains the most timely crasher in F1. These are all from 2022, of course. He was very um, busy in 2022. <laughs> he really A dominant really was. season from Nicholas Latifi. Uh, again, August 28th, 2022, Latifi is the folding chair of F1. He um, is. Appears just when you need him most. I regret none of these. So if Williams blocked me on that, let me just say, soft. You're You're an extremely soft racing team, Williams. And uh, you also you also tweeted uh, a a link to this podcast and said, Jessica Smetana and I addressed the biggest story of the F1 weekend: Latifi hitting a groundhog. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's a whole lot of of Nicholas Latifi posts, and I would imagine that it may be specifically the one in which you ask for his head, which of course was a joke. I, I think um, at the time maybe. Uh, yeah, I can see why they maybe blocked you. Yeah, this is this is what you should always do when somebody blocks you, which is you go, "What took you so long?" <laughs> what you do the old Newman? What what if anything took you so long? By the way, Nicholas Latifi as a point of comparison, in three years with Williams Racing as a full time driver, nine points, nine points. There you go. So, All right. I mean, by comparison, like a, a more successful driver. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, to your point about Logan Sargent, it's obviously a bummer for him. Getting replaced, yeah. especially sort of mid-season, is a bummer, Um. especially, you know, when it's very obvious why. Like, he crashed the car a lot and cost the team a lot of money. Um. So that will probably be the end of his f1 career which is sad and it stinks and he does have a lot of fans who are probably bummed about it he was the only american driver in f1 and so a lot of americans really you know cheered for him um but uh the flip side of that is now a totally new driver gets a chance to sort of like get on the grid and doesn't really have anything to lose because williams already has two drivers for next season and yep. carlos signs and alex albon like you said so there's what, like nine or eight or nine races left this season. And uh, Franco Colapinto will now get to sort of like see what it's like to race an F1 and get a shot at like some some really meaningful uh, experience. Um, so that's, you know, there's a there's a silver lining to every gray cloud, which is that like one young racers F1 career sort of ends abruptly and another one gets his shot. But again, it's like not a great car. So no the expectations are. Don't crash it. That would be don't probably what they this. want. <laughs> Job one for Colabinto is this. Please don't crash this. Yeah. Finish P20. We don't care. Please just get it back to the paddock in one piece. That's all we ask. Um, what is Latifi up to? I, I heard last he was at like Harvard Business School or something. I, I wonder what he's up to. Uh, you know what? I, I hope he's living. That's what I hope. I hope he's living and not thinking about F1 at all. London Business School. August London. 2023. Sure. Okay. Oh, fellow grad, uh, fellow alum with uh, soon to be alum with uh, Mick Jagger. <laughs> oh, 
also. I knew you were going to say like a celebrity, and I was picturing like Kim Kardashian because of that oh, one meme Mick, of her Mick standing. Jagger, <laughs> London Business School graduate. Harvard Business School. Um, yeah. So, anyways, that's that's some some late breaking news. Like for for once, mm-hmm. news broke before we recorded, which was cool. I I enjoyed that. We'll Thanks, see F1. what happens right after we're done. And I think my hiccups went away. I know. I don't want to jinx it, we're but I on. haven't hiccuped in a minute. We're coming online. Um, Reading your scary tweets about Nicholas Latifi scared them out of me. That's right. <laughs> the the hell hath no fury like a social media manager scorned or a Nicholas <laughs> Latifi fan. Um, uh, but we should we should maybe talk about the Dutch GP. Not the most exciting of races. No, not gonna lie. Could have used some rain or like a a little cloud burst or something. Uh, because the winner of this race finished the race twenty seconds ahead of the next fastest car, and Spencer. Mm-hmm. The shock of the last three years is that it wasn't the Red Bull. It was the McLaren. Lando Norris finished this race way out ahead of everyone else. And now, is it fair to say the race is on? So. Sherlock Holmes voice, the game the, the game is set. Up. Wait, what is it? It is, or, yes. The game's afoot. Or foot. The game's afoot. That's it. The game's afoot. Yes. And a legitimate thing we could say at this point. Didn't really think that was possible at the start of the season maybe didn't think it was possible you know a third of the way into the season but yeah i will cite a in the constructors chase at least in the constructors race uh after what race 18 at this pace that's when mclaren will catch red bull that's projected that's from a graphic shared by luke smith of the athletic after the dutch gp but and probably McLaren, who at the start of last season, describe how we felt about McLaren at the start of last season. I mean, they looked so bad. They were like back yeah. of the grid and they were acknowledging like we made a wrong turn in our development and we know we will not be competitive until we have this sort of like, you know, it's because it, it takes mm-hmm. like weeks to sort of like undo a wrong turn essentially right. i'm 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 like really dumbing this down for myself and I, for, I can dumb it down <laughs> even further else. if you're in one of those video <laughs> games where you have like the development tree and you accidentally choose pottery instead of choosing uh you know iron working and you go oh no i can't build a tank out of clay i i need to go back and figure out how to build a tank or i can't defend right. my army it takes time uh, you got to go back and then you got to start over so yeah, yeah they were they were not finishing well at all um, and then like midway through the season, they came, they got their, up, their updated, you know, packages and it was suddenly like, okay, McLaren's got some pace. Yeah. They're doing a lot better. And so since then it has only improved, but I would say also Spencer, part of the equation here is not only that the McLaren has gotten really fast, but the Red Bull looks like it got worse. Is that fair to say? It's been a real good week for conspiracy theorists, Jessica. It's oh, been an it really amazing been. week for them because- Every single crazy tinfoil hat theory about uh, illegal uh, spoilers or out of regulation modifications to the uh, Red Bull racing machine, the performance would indicate that something was, there was something valid to that, that there was some element of the car they had that no one else had that turned out to be out of spec. So if that's what you called, if that's what you believed, been a real strong week for you your futures market is looking real robust yeah there were there were sort of like um disturbed radio messages from max verstappen Mm -hmm. about like not having grip and not being able to steer easily there was a video that was like going viral on social media of his like uh his you know uh what's it called uh onboard camera like Mm -hmm. showing how uh difficult the the car was to steer at high speeds yeah. Um, and lots, lots of fans, lots of uh, other drivers getting in the fray, arguing about this fact. But I think the the fact remains that like he's not happy with how the car is working, and you can tell a lot about sort of where things are at based on what Max is saying during the race and how frustrated he is driving the car. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's like equal parts like McLaren ever since the 2023 season, you know, midway through after uh, Austria, sort of like. Be- becoming like a a points finisher very consistently until now becoming a, a race winner but also i think like max just doesn't seem really happy the car seems like it's not working as well um and whether it's a conspiracy or not like that 
we are kind of entering a different stage in the game here as far as both championships are concerned because now you have a race in which Lando's winning by 20 whole seconds. Mm-hmm. And that they're, after he overtook Max on, I think it was like lap 18 in this race, like there was no race. Like it was over. Yeah. And when you have Christian Horner post race saying, there was no way we could have won. That's <laughs> it feels mind, good. That's mind boggling <laughs> to me. That the, after the last three years, you're like, yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> now you know what it's like. <laughs> for a lot of reasons, bad news for Christian Horner is good news, right? Like, but, um, and that's a whole other topic. But hearing that from just a racing perspective is insane. That that this team that's been so dominant. Uh, especially on, on, you know, Max's home track, if you will, like if, you know, his yeah. in, in the Netherlands to get blown off the track like that by a car that pretty recently couldn't stay on the back bumper of Red Bull is just, it's, this is a different world. Yeah. And also a race where Max was trying to make history, like we mentioned last week, mm-hmm. being the fourth driver to ever win four consecutive home Grand Prix events. Um, so wasn't able to do that. It's also now the fifth race in a row that the Red Bull has not won, which is if you remember last season, mm-hmm. Red Bull won all but one race. So this is like the last five weeks have been a complete change. Um, and now like, I, I think it's interesting for Lando because he goes from like being this driver that everyone sort of mocked for not winning anything in F1, not having a, a single race win, despite the fact that he's, he'd been in F1 for several years, mm-hmm. to winning his first race at Miami, um, and now winning this race by 20 seconds. Uh, and then there's also the aspect of, like, do we think that the seven points that McLaren sort of gave to Oscar when they made him switch spots with Lando will come back to bite them in Hungary? Because... It's a small, it's a small number. So like, it's very possible that it won't end up mattering seven points, but it's also like seven points feels significant right now. So I don't know about that, but like Lando's Lando season from like the beginning of the year, like, oh my God, this guy will never win a race. He, he doesn't have the juice to now. Like he is the closest competitor to Max Verstappen in the driver's championship. That happened pretty quickly. I would say it happened very quickly. And it is also, I think, a sign to me that the things that in a big organization you assume are are can be fixed short term still can't be fixed long term. I think we thought for a long time that Red Bull was just going to ride this out for this season and maybe the cracks would appear later. And that is very much not what you are seeing. You know, it appears that the turmoil organizationally showed up a bit sooner than some of us thought it would, right? And they, mm-hmm. this all starts with with the death of Dietrich Mateschitz and then the power struggle that goes on between Helmut Marko and the, the tie side of ownership and Christian Horner and then Christian Horner's scandal that goes along with it, which is a byproduct of that, um, of that you know, inner conflict on the team along with his, you know, personal misdeeds. There's a lot there. There's a lot there but we all thought it might not show up on the track and, and on the whole, you know, maybe they're actually doing a better job holding it together given their results. Maybe we'll look at it and go, wow, Red Red Bull's Red Bull's still right there in this title hunt folks, despite all of this. But I think it finally did show up along with, yeah, everyone else managing to keep it together and improve at the same time. It is, it's stunning to me, but you know, at this point, it's a race. I cannot believe we're saying that, but it is a race. The game is afoot. I think we can say confidently now that I know what the phrase is. The game is in my most Benedict Cumberbach voice. The game is afoot. You know how hard um, you know how hard this is, by the way, as like a super cynical fan, right? To, to this is like my cyn- or my cynicism about one. professional sports is so okay. intense and deep that when I say, "Oh man, someone new might win." Or something interesting <laughs> might happen. My first reaction is to say, ah, that's this crap. This crap's no, not going to happen. Dummy. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, it's exciting, exciting things ahead for the second half of the season. Although, like, we have some good and some kind of boring races coming up um, and another, like, long fall break. But mm-hmm. there's there's a, enough races left that uh, I people smarter than me have done the math. If If Lando wins every race and gets every fastest lap and Max comes in second, 
in every race for the end of the season, Lando would win. And obviously, they are not going to finish one, two for every single race for the end of the year. That is insane. Like, that, any, there's still Mercedes, there's still other McLaren, there's still yep. like any number of variables. Ferrari is still, va- is still fast. Charles finished on the podium this week. Yeah. Um, I sort of unexpectedly, I think, for for him and for Ferrari, but um, so anything can happen, of course. Like Max could get fewer than 18 points, and Lando could get fewer than 26 points. But you know what I mean. It's definitely competitive now, and I don't think we were saying that at the beginning of the year. I do want to watch this video with you of Max and Leclerc after the race mm-hmm. talking about Lando's finish because it's kind of like this to me is like ooh. Ooh, this is interesting. Everyone else is seeing what the fans are seeing too. How far were you from? Now? Twenty seconds or something. Twenty-two seconds. Yeah. So that was. <laughs> Charles asked Max how far he was from Lando uh, at the front of the front of the race, front of mm-hmm. the pack, and he said twenty seconds, twenty-two seconds. And the face that Charles Leclerc makes is like. <sighs> god damn it and like they both kind of share this look of like what the fuck (laughs) what man what do we do like what what can we two tiny handsome men in fast cars do about another tiny handsome man in a fast car the f1 that's the f1 story oh my god story tiny handsome men being troubled by other tiny handsome men I love this is I mean if you if you were like Jess why do you love F- F1 that's my answer right there yes tiny handsome men being extremely stressed being over troubled. the greatness yeah. and or mediocrity <laughs> of other tiny of other handsome tiny men. handsome men um okay before we move on from the Dutch Grand Prix there was some like pretty alarming and strange news coming out of another sort of bottom team this mm-hmm. week Haas there the cars were held hostage at the Dutch GP That's so bad. That wasn't even a pun. I'm just from Chicago. That's how I <laughs> just, pronounce <laughs> just my A's. Yeah, hostage. <laughs> uh, so Spencer, are you have you been following this? Because this is mm-hmm. like a this is an extension of something that started years ago, back when you were tweeting about Nicholas Latifi. Yes. Just kidding. Um what what happened here? Okay. So if you'll remember, Haas, a United States company was in a partnership with Ural Kali. Ural Kali is a Russian fertilizer conglomerate, but they have their uh, hands in a lot of different pies, so to speak. Um, and somewhere along the way, it's and that partnership yielded two things, which are of note. One, it meant that Nikita Mazepin ended up being an F1 driver, something that should not have happened. We spent a good portion of the early part of this podcast debating the relative uh, mediocrities of Logan Sargent and Nicholas Latifi at the F1 level. Both of them are Michael Schumacher compared to Nikita Mazepin, who effectively had a seat purchased for him by his father, something that's never happened since or before in F1. I'm not serious about that statement. Don't send me an email. It's sarcastic. Anyway, the second thing you need to note is that Haas, the industrial productive side of Haas, the part Haas automation, Haas automation faced allegations, and this is from PBS NewsHour, that it sold technology to the Russian arms industry via a former distributor. Haas denied the story and said it halted sales when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022. Uh, But... Correspondent Simon Ostrovsky had evidence otherwise. So what you need to know is that, one, F1 will always produce a more uh, outlandish story than any other sport when it comes to uh, scandal and skullduggery among its competition and among its owners. In addition to that, what you need to know is that there was a dispute. What kind of a dispute, Jessica? A financial one. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Between a, a nine million dollar dispute over a payment that Earl Kali believes that Haas owed them, mm-hmm. and then took to a, I guess, a Swedish arbitration court, and yep. the court said, "Yes, that is true. You owe them nine million dollars." Yes, 
Uh, or what? We won't let your cars leave Holland. <laughs> yeah. So so what happened, I suppose, on Sunday was that mm-hmm. Haas completed this payment to their former sponsor. Yep. And then trucks rolled up, packed up the cars, and started driving off to Monza. Yep. Um, that, to me, is like, that's, a, that's about as F1 as a F1 story can get. If we get the Dutch tax police involved in your racing team's business, you, you might be an F1 team. That's what we're talking about here. So they did get to Monza. Haas, after a brief run-in, makes you think, Gunther, good on you, man. Good for getting fired I, at the right time. Yeah, it, se- it seems like a, seems like this is a team that I would also want to not be. Like, they're, uh, they, these, like, financial and political entanglements they don't always end well. I mean, obviously in this case, like there, this was just sort of like a financial dispute. I'm not sure mm-hmm. how you even send nine million, like how they wired the nine million dollars. The rigmarole you have to do if you've ever freelanced for a company outside the United States, the rigmarole you have to do to get two hundred and fifty dollars uh, from them to you into the United States financial system is a lot. I don't know what it takes to get nine million dollars on the fly payable to a guy who has been associated with Vladimir Putin. So a word to the wise to Haas's accountants, they're inbound. The IRS, Treasury, Secret Service, perhaps a lot of people, they're, they're going to be up in your business. You already know that, but just in case, I'm going to let you warn. I'm going to warn you. There you go. Yeah. So that was uh, that was the Dutch Grand Prix. Uh, Spencer, there was another thing that a lot of people have sent to us mm-hmm. over the past week, which is a, a TikTok video regarding one of our favorite movies of all time, the the film, the 2004 Pixar film Cars. Yes. Um, so we're going to play that right now because a, a, a number of people have sent it to us. They would like for us to comment. Hello, everybody. This is my presentation on why the Irish Republican Army canonically exists in the Disney Pixar Cars universe. Uh, let's start at the beginning. In the movie Cars 2, There's a car version of the Catholic Pope. There he is. That's him. Which, uh, that being a car Catholic Pope, means that there's a full-on car Catholic religion, a car Catholic church. There being a car Catholic church means that there was a car Jesus Christ. uh, Jesus Chrysler, if you so will. Uh, There being a car Jesus Chrysler means that car King Henry VIII, when he wanted to divorce, his wife had to split the Catholic religion and the Protestant religion into separate entities, uh, which means the cars had two different uh, sects of Christianity, which means that there was a car version of the Protestant Catholic struggles in the north of Ireland, which means ultimately that there was a car IRA. And it probably looked something like that, but the question remains, now that we cleared this up, if the cars were the members, then um, what did they what did they explode? What did they blow up? Human bombs. There are a lot of things that the cars the universe implies exist. Um, the Irish Republican Army, evidently one of them. Uh, another thing that implies the existence of Syracuse University, because Bob Cartrip or uh, Bob Costas is in. The True. Cars. Yeah, so there has to be a Syracuse University. Huh. Jim, it's the only well, university I know of that's that explicitly exists or implicitly this, exists in the car yeah. universe. This brings up a troubling now question about the existence of Jim Beheim in the Cars universe. But he's real. Um, if you told me that there was a Pope car in mm-hmm. Cars Two. I would have already watched it by now, Spencer, but you were holding out on me. It's explicit that car torture exists in the Cars universe because it occurs in the Cars movie. Yeah, there is. And yes, our producer Harry chimes in. There is a 2-3 zone in the Cars universe. There's already a player who fits the Car universe because his name is Carmelo Anthony. Wait, Mello's in Cars? If Syracuse exists. Wait, you're right. Oh, my God. Okay. (sighs) See? And if Mello is there, it implies the existence of Tom. Don't Tippett. even have to change his name. Don't <laughs> even have to change his name. He's right there. So that's fascinating. Okay, so according to the Cars like Wiki fandom page, it says the Pope is a white car and the leader of the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. So, the, but it says the Pope is a white car, not like 
the white car is the Pope. Am I? I, I this is too much. It is. I'm it confused is. already. I've already confused myself. <laughs> so the the car itself is the Pope, and the Pope's like um, bishop hat, Pope hat. I don't know what they're called. Mm -hmm. I should probably know that. A mitre. Um, I believe it is yes, called a mitre. That's probably what it is. Who went to the Catholic that, University here? Come on. <laughs> well, if the Pope exists, is there Notre Dame football? Is where I'm trying to go with this because we have we have the nation of Ireland and we have the Pope and did all the cars then migrate to I mean this the car but cars takes place in the United States already so yeah but but yeah I would I would say yes Notre Dame football would by definition have to exist in the cars universe mm -hmm. if there is a car pope right yeah in addition right. to that everything in Italy are everything in Italy is real so there had to be True. not only a car if Italy exists then everything entangled in the history of the Italian nation has to exist, which means there was a car Pompeii, a car Vesuvius. Um, there's car bad, Mussolini. there's bad car disco, bad Italian car disco, and um, Fabio is real. There's a car Fabio, so car Fabio. What about a car Giada? Yeah, it's got to be car Bobby Flay. Yeah, we've now. If there's a Giada. There's got to be a Bobby Flay. <laughs> that, that means that that there... means there's cars beats Bobby Flay. Oh my God! Mm -hmm. There is a car Lumbo. Played by oh, Peter, played by a no. car Peter Falk. Yeah. Oh my God, car Peter Falk would be the greatest character in the history of Pixar. One more thing. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, mm -hmm. and it's just his car from Colombo. His little. It would be the Peugeot yeah. car. Yeah. I think, oh I think it's a Peugeot that he drives in that. Yeah. Is it? Oh, it seems a little bougie for Colombo. Yeah. So you can. Do you want to know how far you can go down this rabbit hole? The internet's ready. Just go, go, go. Search Reddit for things implicit in the cars universe you'll be horrified absolutely horrified well this this tiktok certainly took us down a path that i wasn't expecting but i i i enjoy it i'm glad i'm glad we went to it though that's fine especially because we do have i think um maybe a confusing race coming up in the form of monza monza has just been resurfaced um it is a darker surface Darker surfaces tend to mean greater heat retention. Greater heat retention means more wear on tires. Are we going to have a tire nightmare upcoming at Monza? Perhaps, perhaps, just in case the season wasn't getting interesting enough, you might have a race where no one understands how to manage tires whatsoever. Could this lead to a confusing winner and an even more confusing outcome? Yeah, yeah, we could totally end up with that. So uh, look forward to that chaos. You're right. A 1959 Peugeot 403. That's Colombo's car in Colombo. Spencer, you nailed it. I honestly, as a as a big Colombo fan, didn't know that. This is, you learn something new every day. It runs like a top. Yeah, that's usually a peep. When he ever he, there's a running gag and it's very subtle. But whenever Colombo drives his car and he pulls up, people are like, "Is this safe? Is it okay?" And he's <laughs> like, "It's fine. It's great." And it's obviously not. Uh, God, love God, love Colombo. Uh, but yeah, we got Monza next weekend. Monza. Uh, the Haases will be there. The McLarens will be there. Mm -hmm. And if it comes down to tire wear, I feel good about McLaren in this race, Spencer. I don't know about you, <laughs> but I I feel good about them being able to not like you know lose any of their speed late in stints. Hey, we are we, we're missing like one little at. thing that might spoil at least one of McLaren's parties, and they've been very well behaved boys to this point. But Oscar's right there. And Oscar mm. is getting faster and faster. He had kind of a disappointing Dutch Grand Prix. Might be a good spot to see how much we can ratchet up the tension between those two. That's the thing. If if we no longer have to worry too much about Red Bull or Ferrari catching up, that means the only competition on the track is between teammates. And that's always a fascinating one, especially with two young drivers with a whole hell of a lot to prove. I'm excited. Um I guess that also would mean there's a Cars Guy Fieri and then a Cars Triple Ds. Yeah. But if it's a drive-in, how does how does a drive-in work if you're if they're cars? Yeah, this that also means be... this also means that canonically, because there is a Daryl Car Trip, aka okay, Daryl Wall Trip, in all of mm. this, then that means that there is a Car Dale Earnhardt, and that Car Dale <laughs> Earnhardt died in the Cars universe as well because cars are mortal. 
This is kind of like giving me the shivers now. I mm-hmm. think we should. I think we should move on. But we'll be back next week with another episode of DNF. I forgot. Um, Junior's Junior's in one of the movies. So yeah, done, done. Sorry, we're done. I'm I'm shutting off that rabbit hole before the like, madness gets any deeper. Follow. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this has uh, been a smooth and hiccup free Jessica Smetana, along with myself, Spencer Hall. Uh, the game is know, afoot. The game's afoot. <laughs> <laughs>